Hello and good afternoon from Edinburgh. It's kind of mixed weather today. It's not like it was in St Andrews last week. We got quite a wet day, quite a windy day there. Uh, <laughs> it's an understatement, today, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> we've been getting a bit of wind coming in now and again. So uh, kind of mixed, a bit of blue sky as well. And we're going to be guiding the Stockbridge area, uh, this area today, um, but another part around Stockbridge we haven't done so far which is going to be St Bernard's Crescent to Anne Street and then down to Danube Street which is some of the most picturesque architecture as well as some very interesting characters, historic characters uh, who've uh, connections with this part of town. So I'm going to start on the tour today and we're in what we call uh, St Bernard's Crescent here but just behind me here is uh, Carlton Street and Leslie Place. Now both of these streets are quite significant because uh, Carlton Street, uh, further down here, uh, used to be the St Bernard's Mansion. It was a big house, mansion house, because this area of Stockbridge, it was a kind of a village which was away from the centre of Old Town Edinburgh, going back certainly to the 19th century. So the landscape was very different, but it was very green. There was a lot of uh, agriculture, there was a lot of kitchen gardens. It was a very rural uh, atmosphere down here today, and you can still see small fragments of the original village which are still around, but Stockbridge today has been absorbed into the city. But just uh, down there was uh, St Bernard's Mansion, and it was there that one Sir Henry Rayburn who I've spoken about before, a notable portrait painter of the 18th, 19th century, stayed. So we're going to start walking a little bit along this marvellous uh, terrace here. And it's very similar to Bath, if you've been to historic Bath. And the first part of this uh, St Bernard's Terrace was uh, underway in 1824. Uh, by one architect called James Milne. Uh, James Milne, Edinburgh architect, he was uh, known much in further afield in Edinburgh, of course. He was quite an innovative architect. He brought in what was called a hewing machine. Hewing, H-E-W-I-N-G, which was an automated way of cutting stone, which meant that uh, the process of building these terraces and so on would be much quicker and it was steam operated this hewing machine. So James Milne was a friend of Henry Rayburn and the two of them worked together because Henry Rayburn had come from quite a poor background. He was the son of a miller uh, in milling grain and the best move he made in his life was to marry a very wealthy lady. It was Anne Edgar and she was the widow of one very wealthy man who was uh, Count James Leslie and we've got Leslie Place down here and he was a hugely wealthy landowner and he died leaving his money to Anne and when uh, Henry Rayburn married of course uh, he inherited that wealth as well and he was able to buy additional land uh, and the states. Now if you look up at the architecture you'll see that we've got what are called Doric columns. It's very Grecian and these columns that are fluted at the top they have got a very simple top which is called uh, Doric, one of the orders of architecture. We have got Doric and Ionic and Corinthian so this is the first uh, uh, example of that type of uh, capital as we call it. Now the columns in the centre here uh, to give a very symmetrical view uh, and two wings either side which mirror each other in a very symmetrical way and this was built with a view to generating income by Sir Henry Rayburn because by the time this was being uh, built he was uh, very wealthy but his son was bankrupt and so he had to generate even more wealth so he was in the business of what was called fewing, which meant buying up land and making it available for people to build on and then gathering income from what was called few duty back then. So it was a wealth generator, some of these uh, areas of uh, what is that, what, what, what is Stockbridge. You see the, the windows normally 
uh, at the bottom, uh, this would be where your dining, sorry, yeah, your, your dining room would be. And towards the back, there would be a kind of small bedroom, a small retiring area on the bottom floor. Down below would be for servants usually, uh, in the basements here, but now today they are accommodations, they are apartments. And the higher up you went, the next floor up would be your drawing room, where the ladies would withdraw uh, for the gentlemen to have their port and cigars after dinner. And then the gentlemen would uh, come up later on to um, be with the ladies involved in playing cards, card games, uh, general socialising, a bit of music, a bit of poetry. So uh, it was all very much geared to the lifestyle of the time. Now on this doorway here it says the name of the person, an architect underneath it. So there's a lot of professional people very who professional stay people, yeah. around this part of town. You get a lot of advocates here as well. Yeah, some of them are actually townhouses and some of them have been converted into apartments. Yeah, absolutely. Now, of course, Edinburgh is known for its legal practice, a place where many lawyers, many advocates, many judges have uh, trained. And uh, there is a lot of lawyers who live, especially in this part of Edinburgh, in the Stockbridge area. Quite stunning. It's quite heavy architecture and it is also popular for filmmakers. And we've had uh, the film Great Expectations, which was filmed here, the Charles Dickens novel. And we've also had a film called Mary Riley, and uh, that is a spin off from the Jekyll and Hyde stories by Robert Louis Stevenson. So uh, if we turn around again before we go up the hill, you can maybe see the trees in the middle. Now this is the remnants of the St Bernard's estate because you would have a carriage drive which would go close to these trees. It would turn the corner and end up at St Bernard's mansion down at the bottom before all this street architecture came into being. So today we have got mainly ash trees or some sycamore in there as well but originally there were elm trees here, and they were known as the Rayburn Elms, but uh, they suffered very much and they had to be taken away in the 1980s. Now this centre area is a kind of semi-private garden area where people from the houses here can go and meet and socialise, get a bit of space because they do not really have uh, gardens assigned, individual gardens assigned to their, their houses. So we're walking up. Uh, St Bernard's Crescent at the moment. You may wonder, who was St Bernard? Well, he was a monk from France from the 12th century and he was what we call a Cistercian monk, but he was also involved with the Benedictine order, St Bernard, uh, and he, through legend, was thought to have come to Scotland and wanted to return to nature very much and stayed in a cave just down beside the water of Leith, very close to where we are today. So hence the name St Bernard's. So we've got like various buildings. We've got the St Bernard's School over here as well, which is now apartments. It's and a St. lovely Bernard's. building. The, the architecture in the school is lovely. And it's lovely apartments has been converted into as well. So they Again, in, in Scotland, we tend not to tear things down like they do in the United States when you, when you move into a new house. Yeah, yeah. Um, we like to restore and maintain. Nothing yeah. goes to waste. Conversion. <laughs> Repurpose. <clears throat> Repurpose. Yeah. So, as you know, if you've been to Edinburgh, and you've maybe seen through our tours, most of the time you're either going uphill <laughs> or downhill. And once again, here it's we go. Really uphill. Going uphill. <laughs> <laughs> I always think that's the thing about Edinburgh. It's like... All the hills seem to go up and none of them seem to come down again. You know, you're always climbing hills. That's right, that's it. Keeps us fit. And it makes the Edinburgh so beautiful because it's got its seven volcanic hills <clears throat> called Anne Street. Now, property in this part of town is quite high price-wise. 
um, and also lovely bluebells there. Oh, this is amazing. This is another one of these kind of intimate hidden spaces uh, where you can get a nice bit of greenery and uh, the bluebells of Scotland. It's often connected with Scotland. We've got a, a tune, a cardian tune called the Bluebell Polka, played by Jimmy Shand, the cardianist. So, uh, and you've got a song about Mary, my Scots Bluebell as well. Mary, my Scots Bluebell, that's right. Very endearing description. So, Anne Street. Properties here can be at least about one and a half million or more. So probably for some of the larger properties, they're in excess of over two million pounds, maybe more than that even. And some are quite expensive, extensive, with five bedrooms, two public rooms and three bedrooms, uh, some of the bigger ones. I'm just going to take a little wander along here. That's the broom, it's coming out. We don't call it, in the States, I think they call it Scots broom, but because we're in Scotland, we don't need to use the adjective. We don't need to broom. do that, no. <laughs> and I'd like you to look at this little garden here. It's called the Rayburn Garden, of course, after Henry Rayburn, the portrait painter who was talking about earlier. We had huge connections with this area. Of course, he lived at uh, St. Bernard's uh, Mansion House. And this garden was gifted by the Caledonian Insurance Company, uh, of which uh, Rayburn was a director. OK, now I've got a local... Uh, I would like to <laughs> add a bit of colour by speaking to uh, a gentleman who stays here in Ann Street, and this is Alan here, and we're just talking about the history of it, but I'd just like a, a little bit of information about what it's like to live here and some of the great things about it. Oh, it's... it's I need to it, get... It, it's very nice. I mean, the, um, we don't have a front garden. Yeah. Everybody else does, but... Um, uh, that's just the luck of the draw. We could afford the house because we didn't have a garden. We also don't have the basement, but uh, no, it's very nice and uh, uh, scenic. And but uh, although we don't have the garden, we've got this on our doorstep. So, uh, do you have a back garden? No, there is one with the basement flat. Ah, I see. But it's uh, it's it again is a wee bit down and pokey, and not uh, I'm not too sure that uh, uh, it gets a lot of sunshine. But. That, 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 that bit doesn't worry us. We've also got access to the Rayburn Garden at the, 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 at the, at the far end, so that, mm. uh, that, that works well. So you've got plenty of green spaces to go out plenty and enjoy. Plenty of green spaces. Lovely. What we don't have are parking spaces. Well, so you have a lovely place to live. <laughs> we have a nice place to live, and it's very accessible. Yeah. Actually, I got rid of my own car about 10 years ago, and uh, I, I do use public transport, but I mainly walk. Mm -hmm. Or if I can't, if that's not suitable, I belong to the City Car Club or the Enterprise some Car yep. Club, and it's got a, a cars just down, down, down the corner, so that's uh, that's all right if I want to go to golf or anything. Like that. Excellent. I, I don't live in Nancy, but I've been looking at a bit of the history of it, and I was just wondering. It has got a tradition of a community where people uh, used to get together to sing carols and various other... Uh, and you call yourselves Ann Street Society. Society. Uh, <laughs> of which I had the pleasure, the honour of, uh, of, of the chore of being the treasurer until a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, it's not very demanding, but we all do subscribe. And the main, the main subscriptions go to the upkeep of the gardens here and insurance against these trees falling down and landing on somebody or somebody's car, which uh, when I was treasurer was, was my main nightmare. So, but it didn't happen during my tenure, so I've already... But yeah, we, I mean, we don't do a lot of things together. We, uh, we have a carol singing on, on Christmas Eve and, and then usually have a party after that. Um, it used to be the tradition that the gardens were also opened around about the, the early in, in April when things were just, spring was just beginning to come, although spring didn't come this year. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's, that seems to have lapsed, partly, partly COVID, but I don't know, don't know what else. Um, and then, what, would it be three years ago, four years ago now, we had a, a big street party to celebrate the 250th anniversary of the first house being, being started. Oh, wow. So that, that, was a, that was a grand do. Yeah, that's incredible. And um, I take it these are listed, and uh, how difficult is it if you need to do repairs or improvements? Because I, I would imagine they're grade A listed, are they? The, the, yeah. They are, yes. Yeah. And it's, uh, well, I'm never quite sure what grade A is and how the yeah. different English ones and Scottish ones work. But no, that's a, that's a bit of a nightmare. And uh, heaven knows how we're going to cope if we have to install heat pumps and things like that. We can't... Uh, well, it's very difficult to get double glazing, to mm. get approval for double glazing, and very expensive. And, um, uh, you know, if we have to... 
they're, they're not the, they're not the best insulated houses, and there's not a lot you can do about it. Apart, we've got insulation in the roof and things like that. But yeah, yeah. so your heating bills are quite high then. Oh, the heating bills are quite <coughs> high. Yes, but mm -hmm. oh, okay. so we just have to put up with that. Drain and bear it. <laughs> yeah. Well, we could go cold, of course, but I, I believe in dressing up and going cold. My wife is not quite of that persuasion. I'm always like, put an extra layer on. <laughs> and save, I, save I, electricity. I want a bagpiper as well, so I don't know how often you get out to play your pipes. Uh, not, not now, just now, not very much. When we were doing the... Um, the, the clapping for the nurses and that sort of thing. I would I, I got the pipes out for that. Yeah. I had them out for um, um, the 51st Highland Division being taken at St. Valerie to mark that, and uh, VE Day, I think, was the other occasion I had, I had them out. So, but uh, I still play the small pipes in here, of course, but uh, I don't often play the big pipes these days. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That's, that's been great. Thank you for coming out and no, giving no, us a no, bit of information. No, 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 that's no, no. fantastic. I'm, yeah. I'm glad. I, I, I was supposed to be on a route for looking after the garden, but um, that seems to have fallen by the wayside as well because I haven't been called upon to do anything. That Your bluebells are gorgeous. You've got a good they, show they, of bluebells. Nice. And I, I love the birds as yeah. well. Uh, oh, yeah. So it's yeah. great. Oh, well. Well, More power to your, uh, your, your walk, anyway. Thanks very Thank much, you. Alan. Much Thank appreciated. You much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you can hopefully hear the birds there. Um, now, we are going to take a little walk up here. Uh, the houses are just spectacular. In fact, the Queen Mother, uh, the Queen, this present Queen's mother, who had Scottish connections, when she was coming to Holyrood Palace, she would tell the chauffeur, when she was driving along Queen's Ferry Road from the airport, she would say, driver, chauffeur, turn left. I want to go down Anne Street. And she just loved going along here, uh, going over what we call the sets, S-E-T-T-S. And she would often have Prince Charles with her. So there is a mark of how beautiful and historic the street is. And I think uh, probably when we're out for a walk, myself, family, Joe, Joe doesn't live down here, but uh, it's quite a nice area to walk through. It is lovely. Uh, you feel you're <coughs> as if you're out in the country. J.M. Barry, the author... Uh, used this as inspiration for one of his plays called Quality Street. And Sir John Betjeman, famous uh, poet, I think he was poet laureate, described it as the most splendid street in Britain. So you're perhaps seeing a bit of this. Now I'm going to tell you about one of the famous residents, uh, number 20. If you look at number 20 here. Now there was a chap called John Wilson. John Wilson, he was an advocate, he was involved in law, but he was also literary critic as well, and uh, he was a writer too, and he went under the name of Christopher North, that was his nom de plume, and he wrote a lot for Black Edinburgh Blackwoods magazine, and I know we've got a Blackwood amongst our reviewers at, at certain points, and uh, Patty, and uh, he was a very close friend of William Blackwood, was Christopher North, now, um, or John Wilson. John Wilson had estates in the Lake District, a house called Ellery Estate, and he's often known as uh, John Wilson of Ellery. He knew William Wordsworth, he knew Samuel Coleridge, he knew Sa Thomas de Quincey. And we've mentioned Thomas de Quincey, uh, who wrote Confessions of an English Opium Eater. And he's well known for what we call addiction literature. It's Thomas de Quincey. Thomas de Quincey used to spend some time uh, as a house guest at this house and other houses where this gentleman lived. And uh, they would talk about his sparkling conversation, but a lot of it was generated by the opium, a laudanum. And he was quite a creative uh, figure, quite a pe personality. Um, John Wilson, Christopher North, went on to be appointed the chair of moral philosophy at Edinburgh University, which was very controversial because Blackwood's magazine was a Tory magazine. And it was tradition, going back to days of Dugald uh, Stewart, uh, that the chair of moral philosophy should be a Whig, it should be a more liberal type of politics that were in charge here. But because the Tory party were in control of the council here in Edinburgh, they got the support going so that um, 
John Wilson became the chair of moral philosophy. And apart from all that, he made a very good chair of moral philosophy. He was very good. Now, he came here to number 20 Ann Street, and it was, uh, oh, get the right date here, 1819. He came here with his five children and his wife. And one of his first comments was it was very small and it was kind of uh, dominated by some of the other houses. And as you can see, it's an understated Georgian house. It's very, very beautiful today. And you can just imagine this colourful character, uh, Christopher North. And I think I'm quite interested in him. It's another of those more obscure people who were very famous in their time. So we're just going to walk along a little bit and enjoy some of the flora and fauna. I like the old lamps, street lamps. Yes, yes. In fact, there's been street lighting in Edinburgh from the 17th century uh, when it was oil, and then, of course, it changed to gas, and then gas lights were converted to electricity, and the giveaway that this was a gas lamp is if you look at the cutaway bit under the glass, this was where the gas burner had to go because uh, the gas came up and would be lit from the top. If you notice here, although this is paying homage to an earlier uh, type of um, oil street lamp, there would be two bits uh, sticking out for the ladder of the lamp lighter. Well, now these are just decorative features. What's the Scottish features. word for the lamp lighter? Do you know? Leary. 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 Yeah. Um, Lovely magnolia tree there. Colours today are just, just amazing. And over at the other side, you can see one of the larger houses here. And as Alan was saying, uh, parking is a nightmare. If you are living in Ann Street, you're going to have quite a bit of wealth. You've done pretty well. Uh, many professional people are stay here. Once again, medical people, lawyers... You name it, judges. These are stunning townhouses. These are individual houses. Oh, here. yeah. Financial. Yeah, that must be about 2.5 million. Oh, pounds. yes, yes, yes. And would you believe that some of these doesn't end there? If you go through here, they drop down several stories behind here, so they're even bigger and than that's what the you can see. Would, servants would servants quarters, and, yeah. And work. And you notice the bins. This is for uh, sustainable waste disposal where you'll have uh, the green bins for putting your garden rubbish and so on in for being picked up so some of the colours are just just amazing and well, so neat them, this, the, although spring has been very cold this year I've noticed that the blossom has lasted an awful lot longer mm -hmm. as well so all of the blossoms have lasted for weeks normally the blossom would be gone in a lot of the cherry trees but the magnolia's out the cherry's out the hawthorn's out. That's What's right. that expression we use here? Ne'er cast, ne'er cast a clout till the may be. Till the may's out. <laughs> That's right. The may is the may tree. Before I wrap up and pass on to Joe, I just like to say once again a, a reminder that uh, the reason it's called Anne Street is because it was Anne Edgar who was the wife of uh, Sir Henry Rayburn, and it was named after her. Uh, he was very involved with this area. He was seen to be quite a, an engaging man. Um, looking back at some of the descriptions, his sparkling, engaging eyes, and he would invite uh, the poorer people, uh, the kind of well-known poorer people off the street to his house for some food if they were in need. And uh, this street here, if you look back up, is the only Georgian terrace street with gardens at the front which I think makes it so attractive and makes it a place that many people will want to come and see. Yeah. A highly desirable res residential area here in Edinburgh and right next to the water of Leith as well yeah, so you get yeah. lots of the wildlife here and you get kingfishers here in the, in the water. That's right, well. uh, we're not far away from the St Bern as well and um, here the Dean Gardens and if you live in Arm Street, you're going to have a key to access these uh, extensive gardens again. But you've got to pay a bit for the upkeep, uh, chip in uh, a proportion to pay the gardener and Take for access here. Take a wee peek. A little pic picture of uh, St Bernard's Well there as well. 
So it's quite high up here. It's um, plenty of green space. A lot of green space. Because this part of Edinburgh is very bohemian as well. Um, Stockbridge is known for its uh, kind of offbeat, um, and there are lots of characters that live in this area as well. Um, it's uh, got lovely restaurants here as well, so the whole, whole area is lovely. I love Stockbridge. I used to say to you when I was at university, I stayed here for um, about two years here at the, in Stockbridge itself. And I love this building with the curved windows on it. I think it's just stunning. So I'm going to take you down. I, I, what I like about Edinburgh is that you get this duality. And this, we've talked about it before. We've talked about um, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. We've talked about um, the old town and the new town. We've talked about the split personality of the city. And uh, so this is the height of Edinburgh respectability. And you could just, it's very staid. And you almost think it's going to be very Presbyterian in its way. However, one of the characters I'm going to talk about was known worldwide, and her name is Dora Noyce. Now, Dora Noyce made Danube Street famous. Danube Street was famous all over the world because Dora Noyce ran one of the biggest and best kept brothels in Edinburgh. And she herself would be dressed up in a twin set in pearls, she always had a hat with a hat pin in her head. She went to church on Sunday. She was highly respectable. She voted for the Conservative Party. She was high up Edinburgh respectability, but she ran a health civil repute. I just wanted to show this beautiful wisteria just hanging from this. Oh, wow, yeah, that's gorgeous wisteria. That incredible. Yeah. Hanging like bunches of grapes. Now, Edinburgh's always had this. Um, it's always been quite liberal in terms of the shall we say, the sex industry, uh, much more so than Glasgow. And the Edinburgh brothels were well known. But Dora Noyce was one of the best known madams here in Edinburgh. And she always says that the busiest times that she had was either during the Edinburgh Festival or during the General Synod of the Church of Scotland when all the ministers from up north would all come down here preaching their hellfire and brimstone, and they'd be out at night with the ladies. <clears throat> she was taken to court a couple, only two times, and she made a lot of effort to say, you know, why bother taking her to court? She was off providing a social service as she saw it. She was put in prison, two, three month terms in prison, and she said, what's the point of putting her in prison? She was, you know, just using taxpayers' money when, you know, she was happily paying her own tax for, for the earnings she was getting. So she was born in the 19, born in 1900, and she died in um, 1977. Very, very well-known lady. Um, she always said there's no such thing as bad publicity. So she always made sure that when she'd been interviewed by the journalists, that they, she got. The, she always said to make sure you get the address right. And it was said that when the American aircraft carrier John F. Kennedy, when the John F. Kennedy arrived here in Edinburgh. Uh, just at the port of Leith, so there was a queue of sailors all around the street here, and then she put out a word to some other madams in the, in the, in the Edinburgh and outside Edinburgh, and all the girls would arrive in taxis. <laughs> there was just too much business for them. Now, Dora also knew and uh, was very good friends with another famous character here from Stockbridge, and that was Mrs. Doubtfire. Uh, Mrs. Doubtfire <clears throat> was a real character and uh, she owned a clothes shop and she sold second-hand clothes and it is said that you would go into the second-hand clothes. She also kept a lot of cats and the whole place stunk of pee. Um, but that's beside the point. And Dora, some of her customers would leave, sometimes in a rush, and leave part of the clothing and Dora, <laughs> Dora would give the clothes to Mrs. Doubtfire. Now, we just go along here, I'll show you the actual house itself. Before you move on, do I just like to mention number seven here? Because one of our fav famous artists, Horatio McCulloch, uh, used to stay here, a very well-known landscape artist, uh, Victorian. Uh, so it gives you a feeling that it was very intellectual, very artistic, very cultural, this part of town, yeah. 
Oh, it was definitely yeah, yeah, very yeah. creative. Lots of the creative, yeah. um, and it was a, the, one of the na- one of Dora's neighbours used to photograph the, the the customers as they were going in, um, saying that she was going to publish them, but she, but she never had any film in the camera. So <laughs> just <laughs> just sheer intimidation. They got the sun coming out. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, when we did a tour, we did one of our tours down in Duddingston. I mentioned. Uh, an Edinburgh author who was also, um, he wrote for the Encyclopedia Britannica and his name was James Teitler. Now James Teitler, again this is back to the sex industry here in Edinburgh, James Teitler also wrote a book and he wrote it under an nom de plume as a lot of people did and he called it Ranger's Guide to the Women of Pleasure in Edinburgh and I did a little bit of research and I did pull out some of the descriptions so it was almost like a 1700, in the late 1700s, like a trip advisor. And I'm going to read you some of the. We'll go over to number 17, which is which is uh, Dora's house of ill repute. It's a blue door. So, I want to read you some of the descriptions of some of the. What's called the Rangers' impartial list of ladies of pleasure. So this is the number 17, probably one of the most famous addresses here in Danube Street. Dora Noyce made Danube Street famous. So here's a description of some of the ladies back in the 1700s. So this is Miss Betty Clark, and it gives, it, gives her an address as well. It's uh, Bell's Wind. We've actually been on Bell's Wind itself. And it says here, The lady is about 21, of the middle size, red hair and very good teeth. She is far from being disagreeable. If it were not for her sulky temper, which sometimes cools the keenest desire, even in the height of the mutual embraces. But she does understand the power of friction admirably well. I've got another one here, which I think is very funny here. Um, this lady is an old veteran of the service, about 30 years of age, middle size, black hair and complexion, and very good teeth. It was very important about the teeth, because that meant they didn't have any venereal disease. But she's not altogether good-natured. She is a firm votary of the wanton goddess and would willingly play morning, noon and night. As a friend, we will give caution to this lady as she has a habit of making free with a gentleman's pocket, especially when he is in liquor. <laughs> She's a bit like fingers. Then we've got Lady Agnew. I love Lady Agnew. She lives in another part of town. Lady Agnew, this is a description. I, this, this really tickled me. So Lady Agnew. This drunken bundle of iniquity is about 50 years of age, lusty and tall. Being a disgrace to her relations, who are some of the best in Scotland, she regards neither decency nor decorum and would willingly lie with a chimney sweep as with a lord. Take her all in all, she is but an abandoned piece. (laughs) 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 So descriptive. It's like, you know, trip advice at the end of the 1700s. We'll do it. We'll do it. We'll leave on the last one here. This, this is Miss Cobb. This lady is short and lusty, dark brown hair, good skin and teeth, and about twenty-seven years of age. She is very sulky and disagreeable in company. For the most part, she is neither pretty nor possessed one grain of sense. Yet she is extremely fond of the sport and makes a tolerable livelihood from it. We are sorry to give her the character, but we are determined to be impartial. So that just go back, linking, linking Dora from the 20th century with uh, this, what went on in the 1700s. So we're going to finish it here with this lovely architecture. Hope you enjoyed a wee stroll around Stockbridge. I would highly recommend it when you come to Edinburgh to come for a walk around here. It is a gorgeous area and we love showing it off to you. Because again, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's that story of Edinburgh being all as they say, fur coat and no knickers. It's all showy on top, but underneath it, you've got to have, you know, there is a dark side to Edinburgh as well. So I'm going to say thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was quite entertaining. And we'll see you next week.